Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Open your Bibles, Exodus chapter 3, one verse in our Bible study, Exodus chapter 3. When you get there, I draw your attention to verse 14. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, and I've entitled our Bible study, The Great I Am. And I was going to entitle title it, Praying Through the Name of Names of God, but either one will work. We're studying the life of Moses here in the book of Exodus. He's been in the desert now for the last 40 years of his life. God is using this desert experience, this challenging time in his life to teach him and to train him. But most importantly, listen, even the desert experiences in your life, those times where you feel like it's dry and you're all alone, maybe even suffering the consequences of a few decisions where you just find yourself, you and the Lord alone, it's a time where the Lord is humbling you. And Moses certainly needed to be humbled. It worked, the desert did in Moses' life. It worked so well that you can see in his life that like the pendulum swung so far to the other end, where in the beginning, he wanted to take things into his own hands. He sensed the call to deliver the nation. He looked to the left, he looked to the right. He killed that Egyptian, never looked up, finds himself in a place now where he doesn't want to do anything for the Lord. And he wanted to do great things for the Lord a little early, but now he doesn't want to do anything. God has supernaturally called him. Imagine this. I don't know if many of us, if any, experienced a burning bush speaking to us in the backyard. God talking to us, a bush that's burning, but it's not burning up. And God says, hey, Ed, this is what I want you to do. What? You know, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. What do you mean? It's Aurora. It's holy ground, you know? Take off your shoes. And it was a supernatural, undeniable Voice of God, something that we all would want. And in that direction, what do we have from Moses? He's resisting and refusing and offering up so many, I mean, I don't know any other way to say it, but lame excuses. The first one we learn in verse 11 and 12 was, who am I? And that question could be answered, you're the man I've chosen, you're the woman I chose. That's who you are. If you ever wonder, who am I that I could serve you? You're the one I chose. Who am I that I could teach? You're the one that I chose. Who am I that could serve those kids? And You are the one that I chose, God said. But Moses, he offers it up. The second one is the one we'll look at today. It begins in verse 13. Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And that's a valid question. It's kind of an excuse, but also a valid question because Egypt was filled with thousands of gods, little g, and Moses wanted to be able to identify the one true God. And in response to this question, we learn of the beautiful, wonderful character and nature of God. He says in verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The name of God, Y-H-V-H, what theologians call the tetragrammaton, these four letters without any vowels. We have filled the vowels in in the English language to help us remember what this name is, Jehovah or Yahweh. But to the Hebrews, remember, the name of God was unutterable. The Jewish people felt God's name to be so holy that it should only be spoken by the high priest once a year. They simply just refused to say his name even today. They will just refer to God as the name, Hashem. Yet God reveals his name to us. He's the becoming one. I am. The word Jehovah or Yahweh comes from the verb to be. 
simply translated here in the English, I am. The self-existent one, the God who exists, the eternal one, the perfect one, the absolute one, the uncaused one from everlasting to everlasting. Moses, that's who you tell him. You tell him I am sent you, the becoming one. You tell them that, the one that we would learn who was sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for the sins of the world. As one commentator put it, and I quote, the idea expressed by the name of God is that of a real, perfect, unconditional, independent existence. Jehovah, I am, is the God who is personal and who reveals himself to us. Isn't that amazing? We would never know God unless he chose to reveal himself to us. We would never understand him. We would never relate to him. It's his sovereign choice, his divine prerogative to reveal himself to us. And he could have revealed portions of, uh, of himself to us. He could have given us little hints, but instead throughout the scripture, he gives us the fullness of who he is. Remember what Jesus said? They asked him, you know, we want to see the father. And what did Jesus say? Hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. You've seen me, the revelation of God in human flesh. God has chosen to reveal himself to us, the creator of the universe, not hidden, but revealed. Why? Because God is a person. And in his personhood, he chose to let us know who he was. He revealed himself to Adam and Eve, to Cain and Abel, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. And not only that, Jehovah, I am, the God who establishes a personal relationship with man, caring and looking after every need you might have, he's revealed himself to you and to me. You often hear pastors, myself included, Bible teachers talk about a distinct difference between a relationship and religion. And it can be confusing at times because we can use religion in a very generic way, in a very good way, where we refer to our commitment to God, our lifestyle might be, you know, if people don't, aren't familiar with the Bible, they might call you religious. And they may mean it in a good way or a bad way, but what they're trying to describe is that you have a relationship with God, you live for God, you go to church, you read your Bible, but there's a difference. There's a difference between religion and relationship. And let me just say at the outset, God's desire for you and me is to enter into a relationship with him like any other person. Not simply to follow some religious system or some man-made system. Or, you know, the word religion, some of the origins of that word means to be bound up. And religion binds up. It lays barriers between man and God. So you got to follow all the barriers in order to get to God. And God says, no, 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 you can come directly to me. And we see the fullness of that relationship through Jesus Christ, where he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through him. He wants you to have relationship because he loves you. He draws you to himself and not to a system. Jehovah is the redemptive name of God. It was Jehovah Elohim, as we learn in Genesis chapter three, that sought after man when he sinned in the garden, wanting to forgive and restore relationship. Remember in Genesis three, verse nine, then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Redemption, his name reminds us of, salvation, deliverance, restoration. God is the all-sufficient one, the great I am. He's the all-becoming one. He would say to you today, I am who you need. And I love this because throughout the Bible, you will find God attaching his name to an attribute, to another Hebrew word. God will attach his name to words that reveal a beautiful picture of who God is. So if you have, you're taking notes, let me give you a few of them. I have 12 written down here that will reveal to you the first one we've already looked at in Genesis chapter three, verse nine, Jehovah Elohim, Jehovah Elohim. The, then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? He, he is the God who pursues our creator, the, our God creator who pursues. In Genesis number two, chapter 22, Genesis 22, verse 14, he's known as Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Do you have a need tonight? Hello? 
Let me start over. Do you have a need tonight? Well, you can meet God as Jehovah Jireh. Genesis 22, Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. As it said this day in the Mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Number three, he's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Anyone need a healing touch from the Lord tonight? Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. If you diligently heed the voice of your God and do what's right in his sight and give ears to his commandments and keep his statutes, I'll put none of the diseases on you, which I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Isn't that great? Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Number four, Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. He's also Jehovah Nisi, N-I-S-S-I. The Lord is my victory or my banner. It's a banner of victory. Exodus 17, verse 15. And Moses built an altar, called its name, the Lord is my banner. Number five, in Exodus chapter 20, verse two, he's the Lord who delivers, Jehovah Yoset. I am the Lord God, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He's the Lord that delivers. And I wonder how many listening to me today need a delivering hand. You need to be rescued and delivered. God is ready to deliver you. Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, this is the sixth one. Jehovah Kados, Q-A-D-A-S. He's the Lord who sanctifies the Lord who sanctifies. Exodus 31, 13. Speak also to the children of Israel saying, surely my Sabbaths you shall keep for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who sets you apart, who makes you holy. That's what the word sanctify means. And I mean, come on, how many of you listening right now need a little more of the holiness of God in your life? God is ready to sanctify you. Number seven, in Judges chapter six, verse 24, he's Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is our peace. Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. To this day, it's still there, he says, in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. Number eight, 1 Samuel chapter one, verse three, Jehovah Saba, he's the Lord of hosts. Then the man went up from his city, his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord were there. He went to worship the Lord of hosts. Number nine, Psalm seven, verse 17. He's Jehovah El Yon, the Lord most high. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. Can I just pause there for a second and number nine and just understand he's not the man upstairs. You hear that? God is not the man upstairs. He is the Lord most high <laughs> working in your life. You know, it's amazing how we can just, oh, he's the man. You know, I, I talk to the man upstairs. Ooh, what, do you live in an apartment? So who's talking to him? Like, who are you talking about? Because my God is the God most high. Not some man upstairs. Number 10, Psalm 23, verse one, I love this. He's Jehovah El Roy, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. And we need a shepherd to lead us and guide us and take care of us. How about Jeremiah 23, verse six? Jehovah Sidkenu. Let me spell it for you, T-S-I-D-K-E-N-U. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. Aren't you grateful that God gives you his righteousness in exchange for your unrighteousness? He's my righteousness. The Bible says in his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness, Jeremiah 23, six. And finally, number 12, Ezekiel 48, verse 35. He's Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. Where is the Lord? Right there, <laughs> everywhere. All the way around shall be 18,000 cubits and the name of the city from that day shall be called. The Lord is there. To me, it's amazing to plumb the depths. Each one of these can be a Bible study in and of themselves. But to me, it's amazing 
As we are told in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, oh, the depths and the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. But God wants you to find him. He wants you to know him. He wants you to submit and surrender to him. He wants you to live for him and to live with him. These truths and these scriptures in the old covenant, you can pray through as promises, no matter where you are in life. If there's a need, you can pray to the God who provides. If there's a sickness, you can pray to the God who heals. If there's an area of your life that just out of control, you can pray for the God who sanctifies. If there's an area in your life where you need direction, you can pray to the Lord who's your shepherd. If you're looking at life and you're wondering, where are you, God? You can pray to God who's there. He's right there in the moment. But I want you to think of it for a second now because you want to fast forward 1,500 years. <laughs> you go back 15, you go forward 15, 1,600 years from, from then and you would arrive on the seen God in human flesh who came and dwelt among us. And he would come saying in the gospel of John, I'm the bread of life. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the door. I'm the vine. Jesus is the great I am. Turn over to John chapter eight. John chapter eight. God in human flesh comes on the scene and what does he say over and over and over and over? I am. And by the time we come to John chapter eight, the religious leaders are stuck. The timing of God is impeccable, perfect in every way. And at the appointed time, Messiah comes to a group of religious leaders that were misrepresenting Jehovah, Yahweh, taking advantage of the people. And they were stuck. They were leading people also to be stuck. They were stuck religiously, not open to God. They were stuck physically, not open to the spirit. And they're stuck spiritually, not open to Jesus Christ. Notice, notice with me in John chapter eight, in verse 48, John eight, verse 48. Then the Jews answered and said to him, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And Jesus answered, I don't have a demon but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he'll never see death. And the Jews said to him, verse 52, now we know you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, you shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead? and the prophets are dead? Whom do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It's my father who honors me, of whom you say that he's your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I'll be a liar like you. I do not, but I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. And the Jews said to him, you're not even 50 years old and you've seen Abraham? And notice in verse 58, Jesus couldn't be more clear and the translators made it clear for us by their use of capitalization. Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. If you like to write in your Bibles, you, write, you mark this scripture, Exodus chapter three, verse 14. This is a direct claim of deity from Jesus Christ. There'll be people that knock on your door and say that Jesus never claimed to be Jesus or Jesus never claimed to be God. You'll have people come and maybe take up a cubicle next to you and they'll just kind of flow through, man. They show up, try to rip you off and then they're off and they're gone. And what will they say? Jesus never claimed to be God. Every false teaching, every false religion, every cultic groups, they made their mistake by misinterpreting Jesus, misrepresenting Jesus. And they'll come here and you'll show them, hey, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Jesus couldn't be more clear 
He couldn't be more clear of claiming to be eternal Jehovah, Yahweh here by nature. He says it here, before Abraham was, ego am I, which is the Greek, taking us back to the great I am. He said, no, he didn't mean that. That's not what he said. Well, the people listening to him knew what he was saying. Here we are separated by another 2,000 plus years, and everybody's debating what the people that were standing in front of Jesus knew clearly without any hesitation before any false teacher came on the, on, the, on the way, before any false modern day cult arrived, they knew. And you go, oh, Ed, what do you mean they knew? Well, notice in verse 59. In verse 59, in response to this stunning claim, they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. Why would they take up stones to throw at him or to kill him? Because they claim he was blaspheming God, claiming to be God. They knew exactly what he was saying. This phrase, ego I me, is translated I am 18 times in the New Testament. Not only that, you'll remember that the claim uh, is the teaching and claim is made in Hebrews chapter three, verse three and four, that Jesus himself made Moses, who God revealed himself in the Old Testament, the father to him. Jesus is the eternal God. Jesus stays true and he claims what only he can claim to be the great I am. If you meet anybody today that claims to be the great I am, you reject them. Don't stone them, just reject them. They're not telling you the truth. Jesus has come. He died and rose again so that your sins could be forgiven. There is no I am today. He's the great I am. He's at the right hand of the Father. Sent the Holy Spirit into our lives. He came to set the captives free. Jesus is revealing his deity. Not only that, turn over now to John chapter 14. I love this. Moses is getting a dump of theology in just one answer. And it's amazing. You know, you might have some excuses today. You might be resistant to the Lord. You might be hesitant. You might not want to fulfill what God's called you to do. You might have all these reasons and everything. And in answer, just take them to the Lord because in the answer, God's going to dump a lot of himself into you. He says, okay, you don't want to go, Moses? You don't know? Here, let me tell you. You don't, want to, you don't know who to tell him? Let me tell you who I am. I'm the great I am. I'm the becoming one. You're not going alone. I'm going to be with you. Anything that you need, Moses, I'm there for you. That's God. (laughs) It's like amazing. And I know it gets twisted in our culture today. It becomes very, very selfish. This is not a selfish statement. God is making himself available to you. Oh, it's not, you know, well, you know, uh, I need a Mercedes Benz. Be a Mercedes Benz to me, God. Bam. This guy's not going to do that for you. Uh, You know, I need a million dollars. No, what you need is to repent. And surrender yourself to God. Don't you flip the nature of God to somehow fulfill your every desire of selfishness and self-centeredness. It ain't going to happen. You're going to keep fighting and resisting and fighting and resisting until you finally come to the end of yourself. You know, the worst thing that you would want is somehow to have some desire. Oh, you know, give me this. And then somehow God allows you and he gives it to you. Like it says in the Psalms, that God gave them their desire, but he sent leanness to their souls. And we'll see this in a minute. minute, What you want is not something, you want someone. That was the answer. Moses, I'm, I'm not sending you with armies. I'm not sending you with a book. I'm not sending you with things. When you go to the children of Israel and they ask you who sent you, you just say, I am. I'm with you. You just tell them the great I am sent you, the becoming one. Notice in John chapter 14, pick up in verse five, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where, we're, where you're going and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip, you got to love it. He goes, Lord, show us the father. That's all we need. It's sufficient for us. If you can just show us the father, that's all we need. And Jesus said, have I been with you for so long 
and you haven't known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? The words that I speak to you, I don't speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, verse 12, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he'll do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Philip's following along, receiving these truths from Jesus, and he asks a question I think any of us would ask. We just want to see the Father. That's it. That's enough. That would settle it for us. But the response to that request is, Philip, I am. I am. Don't you believe by now? I am the true revelation of what you need, Philip. I am. You know me. You know the Father. And listen, as we head out today, considering the greatness and the goodness of God, the vastness and the faithfulness of God, Jesus, as one commentator put it, is not the great I give. He's the great I am. And what peace and safety and security do you and I gain when we come to God, not for what he can give us, but for who he is, just for who he is. Reading through the life and ministry of Jesus, going through life with the difficulties and the trials that we face, experiencing the hardships and the loneliness and the grief and the anxieties and fears, and you can add to that list. It's easy and natural to keep coming back to God for something, for something, for something. Filling up our prayer list with things, and requests. Lord, I need this. God, I can't live without that. Lord, and certainly there is space for coming to God with our requests. We're instructed to do so, to bring and cast our cares in concern, to keep seeking, to keep asking, keep knocking. There's certainly a place. But what we're learning over time is that we really don't need something. We need someone to come back to that place of intimacy and closeness in relationship. Imagine some of the relationships you have in the human realm. Friendships, parenting, kids, marriages, singleness. Imagine what your relationship will become if you looked at the other person only for what they could do for you. You just keep wanting something from them. It's always something, it's always something, it's always something. Relationships like that don't last, they don't grow. You, you kind of know if somebody's been looking for something, maybe you, you know, you're a business owner or something, from, somebody finds out, is, I want this free, I want this free, I want this free. And you're like, I can't, I can't, I can't. And you know, the month later, you see them walking in the parking lot and you just avoid them. There's no relationship when that's all that someone, all that someone wants from you is wants. There's no relationship in that. You know, it's the depth of our hearts that we want relationship. We want truly something that gives and takes, gives and takes. And God showed us the pathway to real deep abiding relationships is his agape love. That we would learn to love the Lord God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Then we would be equipped to love each other. And greater love has no one than this, than what? To keep asking for everything from them all the time. That's the greatest love. Of course not. Jesus said that you might what? Lay down your life for a friend. The greatest relationships come through self-sacrifice and service and commitment because through time and testing as relationships grow, those requests are really not, hey, whatever you want, man. you don't even need to ask. Imagine some of the closest, some of the closest relationships you have, you don't even need to ask, don't even worry about it. Hey, I noticed you were worried about something. Are you, how can I help you? How, how can, how, this is what I do. Can I help you? Can I serve you? Can I take a burden off of you? Those are real relationships. And I see that in our relationship with God. We come to him, and if we're not careful, we'll forget he's the great I am. 
that he's already given us, us his best. It's not something that he gives us, but it's someone. Remember Jesus said in John 14, he says, here, here's the key. He said in John 15, verse four, I should say, in the NLT, he's, he translate, they translate it, remain in me. Or we often re- are referred to or reminded of, abide in me. Just stay here. That's the word of the Lord. Just stay here. You remain in me, I'll remain in you. Similar language as he describes in his relationship with the Father. Even now as we're gathering together, receiving his word, you're here in the room, you're downstairs, you're out on YouTube somewhere or on the app or listening on the radio live. Or I mean, so many people gather together hearing this particular word. We have all these huge issues before us and they're huge. Some of them, they're bigger than any of us can handle. If we pooled all of our resources, we wouldn't be able to help you. It's beyond human ability. You come in here with these massive marriage issues. You come in with the wrestling of your singleness. Some of you have got some deep, deep stuff going on with your kids as parents. You got work issues. You have finance issues. You're afraid of the future. You're weighed in with grief. You're self-absorbed. You know, you, you experience failure upon failure and loss. I mean, the list can go on and on because life is filled with challenges beyond our abilities. We get a little lulled to sleep and we, we, we're, we're in a place where, you know, these little things, we kind of victory, victory, victory. And before you know it, you're not giving God the credit for his faithfulness in your life. So they grow bigger and they grow bigger so that finally you throw up your hands and who do you come to? The great I give or the great I am? The one who's ready to meet you, to receive you, have fellowship with you. I find that in needs and all the things that we go through, fellowship with God is not so meaningful to us anymore. Oh, I'm not meaning church attendance. I'm not meaning Bible study or any things that we might have measured. I just mean intimacy with God's not enough anymore. Because if God doesn't solve your problem, then that's not the God you want. And if God doesn't come through for you, then that's not the God that you want. And the enemy is always very careful there. You know, look at you. Look, you know, God, what did God really say? Oh, that sounds familiar. Didn't God promise to provide? And here you are. And he hasn't provided. He's lying to you. The devil is. God has provided for all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. (laughs) Every single one of them. And there's a little bit of a stretch in your life right now where God has provided in the past. He's going to provide in the future. He just has you in a place of waiting. Why? So you might come to him. Not for anything, but for him. That's how it all started. Such a purity when you and I were born again, where our relationship for a very brief moment wasn't about anything, it was only about him. It wasn't about what he could do. It was believing what he had already done. Well, you love me? You'll forgive me? My sins will be wiped away? Uh, Here's my life, Lord. Daily life, weeks and months and years are filled with challenges above our abilities and filled with days when we try to solve our own problems. Filled with days when we use our own resources. Filled with days that only complicate an already complicated situation. (laughs) Because God never blesses our flesh. Never. So we wonder as we come to the Lord and we list them off one by one, asking God, do this, God. Fix this, God. Change this, God. Take this, God. Do this, God. And our relationship with him becomes very one-sided and very distant because we're no longer satisfied with Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. We're no longer satisfied with Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. We're no longer satisfied even at this infancy of Moses' life where he doesn't get the kind of explanation that you and I get We're not satisfied with God's answer. You just tell him I am. You tell him I am. You don't need to explain the burning bush to them. They wouldn't believe you anyway. (laughs) You don't need to talk to them about 40 years in the desert. That's between me and you. 
you know, I find now with social media, like people are, you're, you're sharing stuff with people that's supposed to just be between you and the Lord. It's just you and the Lord. You don't need other people's sympathy. We don't need every, everybody stepping into our lives. It's just you and the Lord. He's doing a work with you. Come to him. Let him use you. Let him speak to you. Let him comfort you. Let him strengthen you. Let him provide. I don't know where it is, what the line is for you. Sometimes I don't even know what the line is for me, but I do know this. There are many things that God has for you in the secret place. Just you and him. He calls you to himself. You're looking for victory over your enemies. Jehovah Nisi is ready. He's the great I am. You're looking for deliverance. Hey, Jehovah Yoset, he's ready to deliver you. You're looking for more sanctification and holiness in your life. He's Jehovah Quadas. He's ready. You need peace in a turbulent life. Well, guess what? The great I am, Jehovah Shalom, is ready to minister to you. Look, Jesus is reminding us right now that he's the great I am. He's the bread that satisfies the bread that strengthens you, gives you vitality. He's the shepherd who leads you, gave his life for you. He's the one that speaks loudly through his word. He's the one that whispers in a still, small voice. He reminds you of your name, writing his nature on your heart, leading us in the way of everlasting. It's not something that you need today. You have enough things It's someone that you long for and desire and comfort, the great shepherd. And I just find if we're open to the Holy Spirit, that we'll come to the same conclusion. It might be different in your home and in your life because we have that uniqueness about us, how God meets us where we are. My walk with the Lord's different than your walk with the Lord, but we intersect quite a bit. (laughs) You know, you're walking over here and, oh yeah, we're experiencing the same thing. And then we keep moving, keep moving. So there's a lot of shared experience, but there's also a lot of uniqueness among us. And even in our uniqueness, the big issue today is maybe isn't what it really seems. What's really up in your face. All these things and all these difficulties and all these issues and all the things that have slowed us down have gotten our attention and literally brought us to our knees. But for what? To get to him. To be in a place of desperation. He wants to reveal himself in a fresh way, reminding you of his everlasting presence. He will be all that you need. He will make himself known to you personally powerfully and permanently. Like it says in Hebrews chapter four, remember in verse 16, I'll close with this. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. He's ready to help. Just come to the throne room. Just let the Lord bring you. Cry out to him. But cry out to him today, even during the song and during our time, maybe even praying with each other, cry out to him, not for what he's going to do or what he's going to give, but for who he is. That you might have a peace in the storm until the storm lifts. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to minister comfort among us tonight as we, we, come, with all of our, we come with all of our baggage and problems and challenges and admit to you, Lord, that in our own context, Lord, I just look at my own life, many times that is my prayer journal, things. It's always things that trouble me. And it's always situations that trouble me. And it's always besetting sins. And it's always warfare in the mind. And there I am writing it down, typing it out, Lord. And you're using them all to get my heart and attention to you. You just want me to worship you in my situation. You want me to rejoice, not for the problem, but for the God of the problem. You're so much greater, so much higher. You're so, much, so faithful to us, Lord. 
And as we come, we pray, Lord, tonight. We come to the God who is long before he ever gives. The great I am who meets our needs and ministers to our hearts. Who made provision for our shortcomings. You said in your word, Lord, in Psalm 103, you said that you're like a father who's tender and compassionate toward us. You know that we're just dust. So I pray that tenderness and compassion over us tonight as we consider your names. Moses didn't even get the full dump. He didn't get the full understanding, but sufficient for him, it was just, you tell him I am, Moses. That's, that's what you're gonna cling to through this whole thing, through all the doubts and all the hardness. When Pharaoh hardens his heart, you're gonna come back to the great I am. I'm with you. So I just pray, God, over your church tonight, near and far, that we would get back to that place of the burning bush, perhaps, when you first spoke to us. We would get back to that place of sweetness and intimacy, closeness, where our walk with you didn't matter what things happened. We didn't care about those things. We, as a matter of fact, the things are what got us to you to begin with. And we just threw our hands up and said, here I am, Lord. I receive you. Let it be such a great work that you do, Lord, as we were just thinking about your promise, your goodness, your grace. Are you here tonight? You need to give your life to Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to do that. Just right now, where you are, you need your sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not a rededication, but for the first time. For the first time, you go, you know what, pastor? What I need is I need to be in a right relationship with God. Would you just stand to your feet? I want to pray with you that today would be the day that you would acknowledge that you've sinned against a holy and a righteous God. That that's the battle, sin. You know, what the world might say is imperfection. God says you've sinned. And the Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, imagine that. The gift of God is the forgiveness of your sins. The righteous. I, I know these are a lot of Bible words and you're like, I don't know, I don't know. But look, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what God desires to do. Would anyone here say, that's me, Ed? And that includes you guys downstairs, watching online or listening on the radio. God knows where you are. You're in a jail cell right now, just thinking about your life. You're laying in a hospital bed, just wondering what the future's gonna hold. You can know the future as you surrender your life to Jesus Christ today. Ask for his forgiveness. Receive it. It's such a gift, so beautiful. And for the sake of anyone that we may not see, we don't want to neglect to help you. That in confessing with your mouth, you can ask God to forgive you. You could say, God, forgive me of my sins. I believe you sent Jesus Christ to live for me, die for me, and I believe he rose again from the dead. And I know if you pray that prayer, you just talk to God, that's what prayer is. You turn away from your sins. God will keep his word and forgive you. And look, even in the wrestling of this room right now, even where you are as you consider your own walk with the Lord, could it be that God's calling you back to simplicity? Could it be that God is calling you back to himself? And it's not about all the things that we've made it. Now, there's an old song that just reminded me of an old song. Getting back to the heart of worship, I think is the, the song. And just, it's not about the things that we made it. God is not about the things that we've made him. It's just pure and simple and sweet. He loves you. And we love God, why? Because he first loved us. And God's calling you back to that. 
the world's upside down, but the church, church is steadfast in the love of God. Politics going sideways, but the church is steadfast in God. You don't know what your future holds, but you're steadfast in the Lord your God. Because he's come through in the past, he's going to come through now. And so, Lord, we just pray for anyone that would receive you tonight. We pray for the stirring. There's just so much ministry going on in your Holy Spirit in the hearts of your people. So many thoughts, so many battles, so many doubts, so many concerns, so much even resistance, Lord, to the freedom that's available through humility and repentance. Does it have to be 40 years in the desert, Lord? No, it doesn't. You're calling people to yourself even right now, afresh and anew, beyond religion, beyond formalities to sweetness and simplicity. Lord, pour out your spirit on our church tonight, on these believers, minister to the deepest hearts, part of their hearts by revealing yourself to them. I am. And Lord, give us faith to believe increase our faith like the disciples said we need it we want it to walk in victory in jesus name amen we pray that you've been encouraged by this bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of calvary church for prayer call us at 877-30-GRACE that's 877-304-7223 To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.